Hi, this is Bobby Edwards from Bridgehead Software. You are viewing part four of my seven part series on disaster recovery for cache based EMRs for hospitals. In this part, I'm going to recover production database recovery. I hope you find this valuable and I would appreciate your feedback. So please send it to our Twitter handle at BridgeheadHGM. Our website, again, www.bridgeheadsoftware.com. This is the production database recovery. So from part one, this is the same graphic that I used to break down the overall environment. And the elements we're concerned with here are the operational databases or the OLTP environment. So recommended protection for the different types of data, uh, given the environment, the type of storage that will be used, the server, and the recommendations on protecting this data. So Epic recommends that full daily backups of the production OLTP database using the cloning capabilities provided by SAN vendors to provide quick access to needed database files and to allow app rapid restoration and recovery. Examples of the cloning technologies um, such as EMC, um, HP, um, use as well as Hitachi and as well as the mirroring uh, or the snap technologies that you'll get from NetApp and IBM. And again, um, particular customer that I con conversed with said their primary requirements for the backup system are that they're capable of restoring production from a clone within three hours and from tape or virtual tape library within six hours. So the use of active recovery mechanisms such as the right image journaling, time sequence journaling, and shadow journaling are important along with regularly scheduled file level backups. Bridgehead recommends these all be used in combination to achieve the intended recovery of the cache environment. No one element is the single mechanism to recover in a given instance, but combined they provide the highest likelihood of achieving a no data loss goal. So the production database, as we talked about earlier in section one, the concept of these volume groups. The systems are broken down into volume groups and where the data sits and what gets backed up is important. The PRD volume group in this particular drawing PRD 01 through 8 for instance, these house cache.dat files these are going to be important to hold on to, as well as the journals in the journal volume group that we have to deal with. So keeping in mind that understanding how all this functions together is going to be an important part of how the backup is going to take place. So using the BLAST cache backup from the earlier section three, you'll note that we're still leveraging that same model. So we have the two bridgehead components cooperate to perform the backup and all the backup I.O. operations take place on the gateway node or the backup server to avoid impact on the production workload. So the goal here is again to kick off this environment the production server has an agent running on it and that agent is going to freeze cache, create a point in time copy, thaw cache. Lastly the, once that's completed, the backup server or gateway node will be performing the remainder of the work, again, separate from the production disk that will be used. So to summarize that, we're going to be freezing the cache rights using, in this case, an epic bin freeze. We're going to create the point in time consistency group across all the volume groups. We're going to resume the cache writing once that's completed using the inst thaw. And then we're going to back the files up using the point in time copy as opposed to the production copy. So this drawing shows something fairly similar to what we're looking at. So you'll note that the control node is configured with the backup job parameters and when it's con when con when the appropriate time is met based on the configured policy, a request is made to the service node. Several things are going to happen from this point forward. The control node will initiate this and will create the logs 
and maintain a record of the backup for future recovery if needed. This also will be used in association with Media Manager to provide the tracking and location of each of the backups that may be performed. So once the control node requests the backup be performed, it's going to communicate with the production node, which has a service uh, node on it. This is going to verify that there is indeed a valid cache instance running, and based on the, on the particulars of the array in question, it's going to resynchronize the clones, or it's going to create, get ready to create a new snap. So once this has been established, we're going to freeze the cache database. We're going to then split the mirror or capture the snap, depending on the technology being used. And once that's complete, we will thaw cache again. This usually takes several seconds to complete, does not take a great deal of time. So very little impact to the operational environment when this is done. Once this has completed successfully, the gateway node is informed and executes the following tasks. It's then going to mount the volumes from the point in time copies or the clones or the snaps depending on what technology is being used here and it's going to mount those partitions, import and activate the volume groups, mount the file systems and create the list of files for the above file systems so that we know what needs to be backed up at the appropriate time. It's then going to write the backup to the backup target. In this case, this happens to be a data domain. So cleanup on the gateway node is going to do one of several things. And again, this is highly configurable. Whether or not to unmount the file system or leave it mounted potentially in a read-only mode has value. Whether or not we're going to export and deactivate those volume groups is going to be determined based on that choice of do we unmount or not. When it's time to resync the system so that we either from a clone perspective or from a snap perspective are aware of what's going on, this allows a very cohesive control over this environment where it's tracked the whole way. So from the beginning to the end, if an error occurs, the system won't go into a, an unrecognized state. The system will be aware a failure has occurred and it will send an email to a user or user group that this particular failure has occurred. What's great about this is each subsequent component, because this is an engineered backup, is aware of a failure. So a failure, although it may occur, will typically allow the system to continue running in operational mode. The backup will have failed, but the system itself allows the system to continue functioning as appropriate. So to go into a little more detail on some of these, the service node or the production system, this is going to identify the volume groups, logical volumes, and file systems on the disk group devices. So from this, we know that each of the volume groups is doing a particular, uh, is required a particular backup of specific items. This information is passed to the gateway node. From here, we're going to create those point in time copies. Blast again. Start the creation of a point in time copy on the defined disk groups. Freeze cache, create those copies, thaw the cache instance. Blast is then going to perform the following on the gateway node. It's going to import those volume groups and mount them on the system so that we can get those copies of files off. Once we retrieve the list of these files and perform the backup, what we do from that point, again, it's up to the specifics of a given configuration. Whether that's unmounted or left mounted is up to the end user here. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to get the device group names and the production volume groups will be specified during configuration in the file setup. From here, the, the gateway node will support the renaming of the volume groups during a volume group import so that there's no collision. File system for each of the logical volumes on the gateway node will be recorded in the FS tab file. So that's the slash etc slash FS tab is where that will be created. 
That concludes part four of my seven-part series on disaster recovery for cachet-based EMRs for hospitals. In the next part, I'm going to cover relational and data warehouse recovery. I hope you found this session valuable. I also encourage you to follow Bridgehead on Twitter for notification on future presentations at BridgeheadHDM. Our website, www.bridgeheadsoftware.com.